just a second. And just, a, you know, just a, for everyone this came up last time, we'd like to um, enable the closed captions. You just click the CC button. It's on the bottom of your Zoom window. You can hide or view them that way. Awesome. Well, we are here and definitely going to get us started so that we stay on time because I know that we have a lot to cover tonight and I'm really looking forward to hearing from our special guests and I'll introduce them in just a second. So officially welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight's virtual program. Uh, the name of this program is Hist Historic Filipino American Gathering Places in Seattle. My name is Taylor Roden. I'm the Community Events Manager here at Historic Seattle. I'm tuning in today live from my home office, although it doesn't appear to be a home office because I've got a great uh, Zoom background going and you'll find out what this is um, shortly in the program. Um, so our mission at Historic Seattle, why we're here, why we're doing this program. Um, we are, are in the business of saving meaningful places to foster lively communities. And Historic Seattle knows that our properties and that our programs occupy the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples. Right. This acknowledgement, thank you, Pio. <laughs> this acknowledgement is not a substitute for developing relationships with indigenous communities or for honoring indigenous stories as we share our collective history, but it's the first step in recognizing the people whose land we occupy. And on a related note of honoring stories and sharing our collective history, I want to note that the month of May, in addition to being Preservation Month, is also Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And it's our honor to present this program during this particular time with the support and partnership of the Filipino American National Historical Society and Cynthia Mejia Quichi. And I'll do an intro, a formal intro of Cynthia shortly, but just wanted to get that particular acknowledgement and thank you on the forefront. So continuing with our thank yous before we hear from our speakers, definitely want to say thank you to our sponsors for making our education programming possible. A big thank you to Bricklayers and Allied Craft Workers, Local One Washington and Alaska, Daniels Real Estate, the Greystone Lodge, the Greystone and the Lodge at St. Edward Park, and Selling Construction. And of course, thank you to our panelists and to my incredible team at Historic Seattle, um, I know Eugenia and Naomi are here. I'm sure others are here, but I just can't see you. I can only see myself right now. So thanks and hi, friends. So I'm going to introduce each of our awesome speakers. I'll read a short bio and then we'll get started with the presentation. So tonight's program, we're going to cover five sites and we're going to hear stories and history and um, other fun tidbits from these three. And I'll start with Dorothy. Dorothy Cordova is the founder and executive director of the Filipino American National Historical Society, which she and her late husband, Fred, founded in 1982. And before FONS, Dorothy and Fred founded the Filipino Youth Activities, which became a vital force for organizing demonstrations in the 60s and the 70s. Dorothy is a Seattle native and a lifelong Central District resident, and she's a decorated and celebrated activist, historian, and archivist. Everyone, please welcome, join me in welcoming Dorothy to our virtual stage. Hi, Dorothy. <laughs> um, our next speaker, Pio. Pio Decano has an extensive education. This is it. <laughs> extensive educational and professional background as a teacher, administrator, consultant, community activist, and volunteer. Very busy, Pio. Um, he directed a bilingual technical assistance center that provided services to Title VII school districts in Alaska, Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. Peel was the former director of a multicultural teacher training institute at Central Washington University, and he currently serves as a trustee for FONS, providing technical assistance to local Filipino American communities in the CNW who are looking to establish their own local chapters. Thank you, Pio, and hi. 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 <laughs> And our last speaker is the reason that we're here tonight. Thank you so much, Cynthia, for reaching out to Historic Seattle um, and, and telling us that we should do this, because totally we should do this, and here we are. Um, so Cynthia is a retired Seattle Public Schools teacher and a sign language interpreter. She's taught in Japan and Washington, DC, and she served as a trustee and former Seattle chapter president of FONS. She's a co-editor. She is the co-editor of Filipinos in America, and I'll share that in the um, follow-up email with all of you. 
And she's also a contributing author of Filipino American history to historylink.org. And I'll also share some of Cynthia's writings um, with you all. I should have been advancing the slides. Wasn't, got so caught up in introducing everyone. Um, I'll share that in the email as well. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for being here. So we're gonna get started. Uh, for, so first, just so that everyone knows kind of what's happened and when you get to unmute and ask your questions. So we're going to hear from our three speakers. They're going to um, share with us. We're gonna go through three, three, five sites. Um, and then when our time is up around 6.15, 6.20-ish, we'll wrap up. And at that, that point, we can take your questions. So throughout the presentation, strongly encourage all of you to just pop your questions in the chat and I will Make sure to monitor those and get to as many of them as we possibly can. Um, and I think with that, we can just get started. Look at all these slides that I missed while I was talking. Here we go. <laughs> so this is our first site. And um, I don't know who wants to start here, but uh, maybe Auntie Dorothy? I'll go to the photo. When you're on mute. Dorothy, you're still, you're on mute, but I just, um, if you click yeah. the button, okay. there you go. Right. Um, it's called, we call it Pinoy Hill because uh, Pinoy is the derivative of the, the, the uh, Filipino. It's the last part. It's what we called each other, you know, Pinoy, Pinay, the girls were Pinay. But uh, the significance of Seward Park was it was our gathering place for picnics and uh, and other events that we held up there. Uh, actually, if we had an event during July 4th, uh, the Filipino community would have picnics there. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't even have to advertise it. They just automatically went to Pinoy Hill. And the reason for that was they had to start their, uh, warming up the food or whatever, but what I remember about Pinoy Hill is are all the tables all the way around this place. People were setting up their food early and um, people didn't just eat at their own table. They would just go from one place to another greeting folks and people inviting them to come and taste some of the food that they prepared. It was a very social thing. The kids mm -hmm. were running all over. Uh, the parents were speaking to each other, gossiping, whatever games were being played. Um, these people didn't have their table, but then they were sitting on the, uh, you know, on the grass. It was nice. You could tell by the cars how old this is. And um, it was, it was a safe place for us. We, we needed to have the companionship of each other. A lot of these are just all the women, it seems. I think the next picture you'll see is also uh, one of uh, a number of the women the, um, the war brides, these are, um, these women are the uh, young wives of um, the men in the first and second Filipino infantry who helped in the liberation of the Philippines. They were all trained here in the United States. They were the ones who were here, who were here in the United States when the war broke out. And then when they went to the Philippines, they saw these young Filipinas. And consequently, um, all of a sudden we had many new families coming, um, you know, in our community. But again, Pinoy Hill on top of Seward Park was a gathering place. Can I, I, I remember it because uh, of the games, you know, the, uh, it, they give you a bath, they blindfold you, you hit the watermelon, you get a prize. And also, you know, just running around is such a beautiful sight. Um, you could hear all the different languages, and mm -hmm. I lived up in the north end of Seattle. There weren't any really any Pinoys up here, uh, so to speak. So it was always nice for my mother to go, and she was part of the War Brides Association. So it was just a wonderful way to get out of uh, you know our neighborhood and meet with other Filipinos and play games and eat lots of food. You know that the first picture you showed, my mom is at, at the extreme right. She looks like she's yelling at somebody, which, uh, <laughs> which <laughs> she's probably yelling at you. <laughs> well, Boy, get over here. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, it was, it was some of her, I, I recognize some of her friends from that, that picture. And yes, it was, 
uh, I learned about firecrackers and how, how, that you just can't hold them too long. Otherwise, they explode in your hand, which happened to me up at, on a July 4th. At, uh, fortunately, it was just a lady finger. So uh, I managed to maintain my hands or my fingers. But yeah, it was a, a real social gathering place and, and, and a number of families that would come up there and they'd be greeting one another and sharing the food, sharing the food. The first uh, picture there uh, showing that, that location of the stoves, uh, that uh, that my my original remembrance is that that didn't exist until later on, and uh, maybe I could be wrong. Maybe did, did maybe I was just too young to recognize it, but it didn't. Uh, I don't recall seeing that because we had to go up there, and where all those ladies who were sitting around there with my mom, that's where they set their their food to eat right there it was just right there they just sat down and brought the food out from the, from the trunks of the cars and just put it right there and we we'd eat right there and and listen to fireworks in the background yeah it was uh boy it was uh, it was a re real unsocial social gathering place so to orient the people correct me if i'm wrong you go up the hill right you come into the yeah. you come into Seward <clears throat> park you go up the hill and then it's right on your right, right at the corner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, so when you go up the hill, you look to your right and that whole area was Pinoy wow. Hill. And then you've got a parking lot. People and in, yeah, we should have a little marker there. Don't you think? Be kind of fun. Yeah, yeah. that's a but good the, idea. But Auntie was also talking how we also use Seward Park further down because we would have uh, Pista Sanayon. For as part of the sea fair event, uh, further down where the amp is it an amphitheater? Is that what you call that? You know what I'm saying? It's a clearing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes, which was usually the last Sunday of August, July, uh, July, right? Right before or around uh, the torchlight parade, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I think Auntie froze. I think she's frozen as well. Um, but I was actually just about to say um, that we're at our time and move us along to the next one. But sh I'm sure she'll come back. Okay. So here's our next site in Pioneer uh, Square. It was actually Longshore Men's and Warehouse Men's Union. Mm -hmm. But thank you for including that, Taylor. Oh, um, apologies. I'll, I'll no, no, fix that's it. okay. I can share it with everyone and change the name at the end. And Pio was saying that it also went by a different name, but people understood it to be the, what, the Alaska Cannery Workers Union Hall. Yep. And Pio has a... A major connection with this building, don't you? Yeah, I uh, I used to go when I was working in Alaska in the mid fifties as a youngster, uh, having grown up with uh, all the old manos who would come up from. Many of them would just come up after harvesting asparagus in Delano and Salinas, and they come up here for the summer work. And it was interesting because the perception of some of them that I talked with, I, I didn't even speak Ilocano or Tagalog, but their perception was this was a lot easier work than the backbreaking work that they had to do as farm workers. They thought that working in the canneries. And as I, as I found out, when I started working up there, uh, it was segregated bunkhouses, and uh, we would be up, uh, where is the street? Yeah, on the 2nd Avenue side, the Greyhound bus would pull out up, and, um, and we'd load on to the, uh, load on to the bus, Greyhound buses, and they'd take us to the airport where we would get on prop driven planes. 
and the my Filipino work fellow Filipino workers would bring instruments and they'd start playing them on the plane as as we were taking off. It was amazing because when we got there, they would set up their bands and sometimes there would be a, a nightly concert that uh, they would put on saxophone, guitar, uh, oh God, uh, trumpet. It was, it was simply amazing taking that important part of the culture, the music up to Alaska, do it for two and a half months and then come back. But the Union Hall was where we were dispatched from. And you were hired down there too. You'd go in that building and they'd say, uh, the foreman would yell out, we need 15, we need 15 slimers. We need 15 slimers for Uganic Bay. And you'd raise your hand, you'd raise your hand. And fortunately, uh, my father, uh, had uh, a lot of influence and control over who was hired and who wasn't hired. And I managed to work in a number of different canneries in Alaska, uh, but being dispatched from that hall and, oh boy, who, <laughs> you mentioned that, the connection that I had there, but, you know, meeting Carlos Blosan and, and uh, uh, watching the union officials and watching those, those foremen uh, pick and choose who they wanted for the second foreman and then hiring the crew. And, uh, you know, I don't want to venture into any politics, but yes, there was some, I believe, just uh, not the best hiring practices that, that, uh, that were followed at the Union Hall. Well, uh you know, um, when, I'm sorry, we lost Auntie Dorothy. I don't know what, what happened to her. But when you, Taylor, when you showed us this first slide, I, you know, I looked, we looked at it, we said, it wasn't three stories. And Auntie Dorothy said, oh, there was a fire. Yep. So we, yeah. the first two sides you saw right here, unfortunately, it's, uh, you can tell that it's been pretty much abandoned. Yeah. Um, in that's, this, where I know, the, that's where the, the Greyhound bus would pull up, right? right alongside there. Uh, you know, I have yeah. memories. There I have are. memories of this place uh, and Alaska since I'm older than you. What I recall from around April, April, May, June, the thousands of Filipinos who would come up from all over, even from the Midwest, yep. so they could go to Alaska. And um, there was a student bulletin that was sent, you know, uh, people who are attending university. And they would have headlines saying the call of the silver, and they meant the silver salmon. And that was a place where many of the college students could go to uh, get money for their books and their tuition. That's right. Or to, right. to live on, you know, yeah. for several several months. Uh, the other thing too, my some of my memories of this place was you were talking about the band, but I remember a different thing. Uh, the people I remember didn't go, the early ones didn't go to Alaska by plane, they went by boat. And so That's we would right. go down to the That's docks right. and I would have pictures of these guys all dressed up. So when we were doing our oral histories, I said to them, uncle, why were you wearing those nice clothes? And his, they would say to me, you never knew who you were going to meet. Because they would- <laughs> That's right. They would actually- You're meet, right. They would meet, they were young, oh, God, you yeah. know? And they were <laughs> dressed to the nines. Dashy, dressed to uh, the nines. Yeah, they were, and and then to the band. You were talking about the band on the boat. Every, the oral histories would say they would stop in all these different cities or uh, towns, and the bands would play. <laughs> they would be welcomed in the town yep. because they would play for the dance uh, when they would arrive there. So the Filipino musicians going to Alaska were really well received by the people in Alaska for more than one reason. Uh, my memories of this place too was uh, in the, for the late 40s, early, it was around the late 40s, the 50s. Uh, people in the um, Alaska Canary, Ernie Manawang, uh, Chris Masal, plus some of the others were accused of being communists and they were going to be deported. Uh, the case was on for a number of years 
they couldn't deport them because they came here as American nationals, though the United States tried their best to get rid of them. Right. Yeah. And so um, we were in college, my husband and I, Alice Senna, and um, our parents told us, don't, they were communists, don't go with them. Yeah. Well, yeah. that was all the re more reason after class we would go down here and talk to these men. They were, they, they were men who came with great dreams and the dreams never were fulfilled. And uh, one of the sad things I recall is by the time we got there at around one o'clock in the afternoon, two of them who were leaders were already intoxicated, but they always thought, you know, you were talking about the hiring practice. I'd say this, that many of them had, their, their purpose was really very good initially. It was to provide their fellow Filipinos and others who were going there with uh, better uh, wages and better living conditions up there. Well, well I want to bring up a little bit before we leave this. Uh, there, there was one notable thing in, during my time was 1981 was when Somi Domingo and Jean Venus were, were essentially murdered right outside or inside the offices of the hall. And uh, as Pew mentioned, uh, obviously, you know, there's graft, there's bribery. Uh, Filipinos, you know, they have a tendency to, um, you know, they group themselves according to being Ilocano or Tagalog right. or Pangasinan. Right. And, and so it, they would, you know, probably favor people who spoke the same language, the same dialect. Anyway, so uh, Jean and Somi were, were activists and they wanted to clean it up. They wanted to clean the graft. They wanted to do that. And... Um, made a few people mad and uh i was not here but i you were all here i'm sure in 81 where gene was was actually killed instantly in the office but Silmi managed to make it outside the hall and uh was able to name his uh his murderers sadly uh, do you recall that time it was it was you know a lot of turmoil, a lot of things going on. There was uh, anti-Marcos uh, um, sentiment. Um, I think the the Filipino community was, you know. Well, you mentioned the KDP. Uh, at odds. I, I did when I was talking to you. Yeah. Um, but so basically, Somi was part of KDP, which was an anti-Marcos uh, organization. But um, the fact is that, you know, you also mentioned Carlos Bolusan and and I have my book, for those of you who don't know Carlos Bolusan, uh, America is in the Heart, uh, require, required reading in the, the studies this. department and uh, at UW. Uh, he tells a story yeah, about uh, coming in the 30s. <laughs> and you mentioned Trinidad Rojo, auntie, also another figure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, uh, you know, you mentioned Silmi. Mm -hmm. And I think I shared with you that uh, I confronted Silmi because I was I was very concerned about his attitude with respect to what my father had done, trying to uh, get under knowing what it's like to come up the economic ladder, and trying to make sure that they had a, a step in the economic ladder uh, to to survive the farm to survive Alaska and then plan. And he always said, get the education, get the education. And so I, I confronted Somi about that. And I said, you know, there oh, are some really? individuals involved in the, in the salmon business that, uh, that really are trying to do the best they can with what they got. And, uh, but I, you know, there were some other folks that saw, saw him in a completely different, un, uh, unfavorable light. And that's, mm -hmm. that's unfortunately, that's what happened. Well, we're out of time for this particular site. So I'm going to move okay. us along and up the hill a bit. Ah. Yes, to Mary. Okay. Mary knows. Um, Actually, we called it Mary Knoll, but it was officially um, Our Lady Queen of Martyrs. And it was um, 
it was a parish that was exclusively for uh, Japanese and Filipino immigrants families. Mm -hmm. uh, it started around 1930. And um, I went to school here and I was, I was married there. So, and then eventually uh, two of the agencies that I was with uh, were housed there. So this place until it was torn down was very dear to me. Um, it was it was a time, uh, um, the Mary Knoll order was an order where the nuns actually, they learned, or the people, they learned to speak the language of the, uh, of the people they were with. So there was, uh, they, they spoke Japanese, there were Japanese classes, but uh, we were all the children of immigrants. And um, even though it was a Catholic school, when I was there in my first grade, uh, the school was still basically non non Catholic. Um, in my first communion, there were four kids who received it, and um, three were Filipino, one was Japanese. And it wasn't until 1940 when uh, all of a sudden there was a wholesale conversion uh, of the Japanese families um, to be they were converted to Catholicism in 1940. I have memories of this place because. Um, it was a gathering place, not only for school, but the church is the one with the, the you see the crucifix, uh, the, the cross on top, that was the church. And uh, the school was the longer part, the two story thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, to the right was the convent where the nuns lived. Mm -hmm. But the, mm. uh, that was the funeral of my dad. So um, this was back in 1936. It was um, the Filipinos were basically Catholic, and um, I'm the little girl somewhere, oh, with a big hat, being carried by my cousin. But um, this was our church uh, initially, and um, believe it or not, we were not accepted in other places. The two churches we mm -hmm. went to were right. Mary Knoll and. Did you go to Immaculate or is that later on? Immaculate Conception. Yeah. Well, what happened, because uh, I said the school was Japanese, 19, um, 1941, December 7th, uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor it was on a Sunday. When I went to school the next day, we got picked up by buses. And um, what happened then was uh, <laughs> it was really strange. I mean, we all knew what was happening. And by March, uh, we knew that our friends were gonna be sent away. And I'll never forget the day that the school closed. All my friends were packed into the buses and those of us who weren't going home, we walked home. And my friends were saying to me, uh, we'll write to each other, we'll write to each other, but we didn't know where they were gonna mm. go. We were kids. Wow. I, was, mm. I, I just turned 10 and um, but I felt it was so unfair. It was really unfair. They were American like me. Mm -hmm. And so what we did is all the Filipino kids then went around six blocks north or five, five blocks north to another Catholic school, Immaculate, where we continued on uh, from 1942 on. Um, the Japanese kids and the families start coming back. Not all of them, but some of them came back. Uh, at church, there were two masses usually during the early days and even continued on after after the war when they came back. The nine o'clock mass was a Japanese mass and the 11 o'clock mass was a Filipino mass. And so um, <laughs> it was a different time. It was a time, you know, it was a time we're talking about it right now. I just think about the good times that we had. Mm -hmm. the, um, I remember um, the, the, the bazaars that we had. I remember the, the, the gentlemen who would do kendo, you know, uh, with their sticks, dressed mm -hmm. up in their costumes. Um, we would, I ate Japanese food and I missed it dearly when they left because they didn't have access to it. <laughs> it for, a little, for a young girl, it was a traumatic time. Mm -hmm. But they came back, and I continued going to Mary Knoll even during the war. I'd go to the nine o'clock mass at Immaculate, and then come over 
blocks away, sits and comes to Mary Old Mass again. Mono so, Dorothy, but, Mono uh, Dorothy, were, yeah. that, were they, were, what was the order, uh, the nuns in order that was taking care of Mary Knoll? Uh, what was the name? Yeah, of the, the nuns. Brothers. Were they Mary uh, Knoll? The priest stayed, you know, the priest stayed there, one priest, and uh, Father, um, Father Tibisar, uh, who's in this picture, uh, he's in the second row and he's the um, third from the uh, right. Uh, when the Japanese left, he followed them to camp. Wow. And uh, yes. Wow. And uh, one or two nuns, one or two nuns also did the same thing. Mm -hmm. What was a um, nun's order? What were their orders? This, uh, this picture that you're looking at is the Filipino Catholic Club. Uh -huh. And uh, that house was uh, purchased, I found out later, by the Filipinos. They, they bought it. I don't know how they did because they weren't supposed to own property, but I guess they did it through the, through the church. So after Mass, a lot of times, after the 11 o'clock Mass, we would go here and they'd serve cocoa to the kids, coffee and donuts and whatever, sort of another social gathering place. But later on, um, uh, after the, the Marino order left, um, Providence bought the facility and it, it, they changed the name to St. Peter Claver at the center. And so it became a, a place uh, where there was tutoring for central area kids. And then uh, nonprofits went there and uh, my one of my groups that we helped start the Filipino youth activities had its first activity, uh, folk dancing and um, uh, mm -hmm. other other events in the auditorium. So um, this place, until it was torn down in the sixties, uh, was very. Well, Wasn't it was uh, Bob Bob Santos also part of the? Didn't wasn't he part of the organization there? Yeah, well, see, Bob actually went to school here too with me. Oh. He was around two or three grades uh, below me for about three grades. And um, when St. Peter Claver Center was created um, by the Archdiocese, I guess, or the Catholic Interracial Council, uh, he took the place of Walt Hubbard, who was the first director of the uh, St. Peter Claver Center, and then around 19th. Uh, 70, Bob became the director of St. Peter Claver Center, which was the tutoring thing. And um, so this was in the 69. Uh, but prior to that, the Filipino youth activities in 1957, we were already using the facility. Mm -hmm. And uh, because the school was, em there was no school, it was empty. And so we would use it. I mean, it was still a gathering place. Uh, for the Japanese who had returned and for the Filipinos who never left. You know, that's interesting about the, the, the generational mix of Filipinos yeah. that went to Marino because yeah. uh, Cynthia and I were talking the other day about the KDP and how they tried to interact with, with quote unquote more, uh, uh, more down home Filipinos that were working in the system and they, we, uh, we would meet at the, in the classrooms, in the, in the school building, uh, meet, as a meeting place, Roy Flores, myself, Bob Santos, and we were all activists in, in a different way. But the KDP folks, we came in and urged us to arm ourselves, get in the landing craft and go liberate the Philippines uh, from Marcos. <laughs> and that was very unusual too though um Pio, because uh you figure by the time that they were doing this um we were already involved in fighting for civil rights here yes, sir. We, were That's not, right. not we were not we were not anti-marcos activists we were civil rights in the united civil states right. exactly. we were yeah i mean it was really interesting and that place was it was it was a place where we gathered um, a lot of us there, my agency that Bob was one of the founders of, uh, Demonstration Project for Asian yeah. Americans, we were doing the research on the problems yeah. of Asian Americans, yep. especially That's those right. who are immigrants. But, uh, but then we, I also did research on the elderly and then the young people. 
because then by the 60s, the FYA moves there. So all of a sudden, St. Peter Claver had everything going for it. I know. Had, and there were, it was not? a gathering place. There were just a lot of people. Uh, we were having kids in the Philippine youth activities. We had kids who were third generation and student uh, kids who were who just came off the plane. And uh, it was an interesting time. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. We yeah. were there, yes, and there was a time everybody, I mean, <laughs> when I think about those days, they were crazy days, but they were exciting, and you never knew what was going to happen. <laughs> there were just, all of Seattle was in turmoil. I mean, marches, we, we would assemble at St. Peter Claver for marches. I remember we did a thing, <laughs> we did something over at... Uh, the old Olympic Hotel, we had to mass somewhere and we, we would go on marches. I mean, a lot of times it was a place that was empty. It was our gathering place. The Asians, the African-Americans. We That's were right. There. That's mm -hmm. right. Remember that old sign that said humbao, not hot dog. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to move us along to our next um, location, speaking of excitement. And we're back in Pioneer Square now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Can I just say something fast before Cynthia does? The, my, okay. the only time I know about this casino is through the oral histories we gathered with people who came in the 20s or even before. And they would always mention the men would rent and I'd say, what did you do in your spare time? Well, they would mention the casino. It was a dime a dance place. And they would always talk. That was the way they were young. They needed female companionship. The ratio of men to Filipino women to Filipino men at that time was something like uh, one woman to 30 men. Uh, so they had to look, and Filipino men were different. They fell in love with everybody, you know, they didn't, I mean, <laughs> I mean I, it's true. Oh, and the, the casino was, there were two, two dance halls. One was Entes on King Street and the casino, which was larger. But they would talk about that's where they met girls and everything. But sometimes they would fight over the girls, and that's when the cops would come <laughs> and break it up. But that's my, I never, I only went it's there happened. once. Oh, well, yeah, you're right on. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah, right. Right on. Jeez. This is a photo I took uh, at the beginning of the year. In fact, I was surprised it was still standing, uh, especially Barney's loans, because to the right of this photograph is the marquee Barney's Loans. And I thought it was one of the buildings that was right here. You can see that on the corner, right to the left, lower left uh, from the, um, what do you call it? light, light, uh, mm -hmm. light pole. Mm -hmm. And there were two entrances. One is where you see the awning, right yep. uh, to the yep. left. And that was a really steep, very steep, very narrow, dark uh, entryway into this hall, this cavernous hall, very few lights. And uh, you see the arch on the right. That was one that was a little bit, uh, had more light and you you came down the stairs, but then you also had a, a platform where you would turn. And uh, the reason my marker is, um, the John John F K, JFK had been assassinated, and uh, my marker is that uh, I my mother worked there worked there on on Sundays. I was eleven years old, so let me orient you. So, looking from the uh, you see the lunch lunch counter down here at the bottom, and the X's are the stools, and I'm walking back and forth, you know, giving the men you know, coffee, and my mother made two kinds of rice cakes. Every Sunday, she would bring a big pans of what we call biko, which are the rice cakes, coconut uh, milk, brown sugar, or she would make bitso bitso, which was um, rice flour mm -hmm. that was made into, she made it into patties, and then she'd um, coat them in brown sugar, and then she'd fry them, or she'd, you know, it was really delicious. Uh, some people know that as carioca, right? And uh, I would, you know, my role at 11 years old was to cut 
you know, slices, you know, <laughs> and give them a cup of coffee yeah. and I get my tip. Uh, and she, we do this on Sundays and uh, I would accompany my mother uh, who, uh, I don't know how she met, how she met Ignacio Navarrete, but in this book, I did some research. Um, Casino was uh, established in 1949, 1949 as the oldest Filipino restaurant in, in Seattle. And it was run by Ignacio Navarrete, who turned out to be my sister's godfather. So that is that is the connection. So on Saturdays, interestingly enough, my family and I, we would go to Mukilteo and we would fish from the dock and we would catch perch. We'd catch a lot of perch and then we'd take it to Casino and he would make sinigang. Oh, sinigang wow. is a, a vinegar our uh, tamarind flavored stew that you know Filipinos really loved uh -huh. and so that's that was one of the things we did Saturday we fished Sunday we go to casino deliver the cakes and serve coffee and I, I remember I would meet some of these characters you know who would come in um, I remember the short the the ladies coming in really nicely nicely made up and hair piled up on their heads and short skirts and and uh i remember uh the old men the, who who dressed so well um they come up and i guess they would consider me their their granddaughter uh because a lot of monks who came here pioneers who came here never went home to the philippines That's right they they came here in the 20s and they died here That's right so uh if you look on getting back to my orientation, so you can see from the bottom, we had uh, the door into the kitchen, you come around, but right before you went into the kitchen, there was a panel. And do you remember the Koksai Theater? Yes, the Koksai Theater on, is it Sixth Avenue kind of, in Hay Park? Of, yeah. It's now where Northwest Asian Weekly is. The black and tan. The club black oh, and tan. Yeah. yeah. Jeez, so there yeah. was Kokusai Theater and, and they would have Filipino movies there along with the Japanese samurai movies. Uh, but uh, somebody uh, would always come and bring a flyer and they would post it. They would tape it on to the panel, you know, right to the right of the door. And that was um, when I got to know some of the Filipino uh, actors and actresses. Uh, and uh, sometimes mom would take us to these movies. It was, Dolphy was a big, uh, he was a big comic. So anyway, um, let's see, rice cake. Oh, I, I have cigarettes. Yeah, and then there's cast register. And then the reason why the TV is in red is because that was where I saw, they had rabbit ears uh, to get good, um, you know, reception. Um, I saw, I remember seeing uh, the John, John Kennedy's either procession or something like that. I checked on um, Wikipedia in the, um, on Sunday, three days after he was assassinated, he was assassinated on, was it Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday? Monday was the actual, um, the funeral. But I remember the procession. And I think his body was being taken from one place to another, but I remember that. And anyway, that was a very important, and that was my marker. That's what I'm speaking from is 1963 as an 11 year old. Down here again to my left, bottom left is the sodas. You know, they'd all, they'd want to have a Coke or a seven up, but I have to go all the way down. It was dark. I hated going to get the soda, but somehow they always made Cindy go down to get the soda and bring it back. So uh, you see where the cash, the uh, money sign is. So look to the middle of the slide and you'll see the phone booth. Well, that thing was, it was, it would ring incessantly and nobody would answer. It was just so annoying. Um, but then you'd see some of these ladies going into the phone booth and uh, they would uh, have their little, whatever they were, whoever they were talking to. Um, how many people remember Suspicion by Terry Stafford? Here's the song. Why am 
am I playing this? I'm playing is that's that was on the jukebox in red on the left in the middle of the slide. Somebody liked that song and played it over and over and over again. <laughs> so even to this day, how many years later, almost 50 years later, I still remember that song. Um, I hated going to the bathroom. I hated going to the bathroom. You can see the bathroom was way in the way in the, I would consider for me the back to the left. I'd have to go between the phone booth and the jukebox because if I went to the right of the phone booth, I would run into the pool table, the manongs, the older men, the card tables, all of those guys playing. And my mother always wanted me to go to the left. And it was, it was, uh, it was really, I can close my eyes and I can see, I can see the, the lights drop down, shining onto the card tables and the pool table and just the noise, the, Jesus. just yeah. the cacophony, the, the languages, uh, the characters. It was, it was really wonderful. It was marvelous. And when Taylor told me, Taylor, you told me that is still being used as a club. I was just floored. It uh, not only is still being used as a club, but a lot of this looks the same. Definitely telling all my business now, but both of those staircases are still in use. The lunch counter is now a bar that's on the same side. Oh, really? The restrooms haven't moved. Um, <laughs> I bet Probably you can still find better. your way around there uh -huh. with the lights on, which is interesting. Yeah. It, it it was a great memory, and I'm I'm glad to to share that with you. As elementary as my little my graphic is, uh, but but really um, that I conclude my my talk, and I, I before I I Pew, you know goes on on his uh, presentation of his father's home. I really want to thank Historic Seattle for giving us this opportunity. Um, as Auntie Dorothy said before we did this program. She said, you know, there's, you know, with this anti-Asian hate, yep. um, uh, feeling um, so unsure of so many things. And uh, these places that we're featuring tonight give us fond memories, right? Auntie, you said something really remarkable, like this is, these places made us happy. Um uh, we were able to meet people who look like us or to talk like us or to feel comfortable with each other. And, you know, my Help message me. is to like to historic, to historic Seattle is, you know, there are a gazillion other, you know, groups. We have a lot of other places to focus on. And I'm, I'm again, thank you for letting us kind of, you know, broaden, broaden your scope. <laughs> thank you um, for choosing us, you know, as the, the host uh, for this. I told you all when we did our rehearsal that it just felt like I was sitting in your kitchen listening to you. So I'm thank you for You're sharing welcome. and for uh, really getting into the details. I'm a detail person. I was definitely that kid. Um, so I love this. Keep going. <laughs> and so uh, this is our last site. And Pio, I know this is mostly you. And I imagine Cynthia and Dorothy, you all may chime in as well. But I will start with your slides and then you can just tell me when you want me to advance to the next. Sure. Uh, this is a picture of my father. He, uh, he I saw a question that came up by one of the yeah, uh, attendees and they asked, why did Filipinos come to the United States? And my, my father is uh, a good example of an individual who came to the United States. He, uh, after, after the, uh, after the, uh, Philippines uh, was purchased by the United States from uh, Spain. Uh, they, uh, the U.S. sent teachers to to the education systems uh, to quote unquote improve the education systems in the Philippines. The uh, individual that was sent to my father's hometown, Iloco Sur, uh, uh, Santa Maria Iloco Sur, was from Lawrence, Kansas. I'll never forget. Uh, uh, Charles Simpson, and um, he took my father in as a uh, uh, houseboy for three years and taught him English and the Constitution, how the U.S. was governed, 
and urged my dad to come to the United States to make a living and because it was a land of opportunity and which my father uh, did that in 19, uh, 13 or 14. It's sometimes that, that date escapes me, but he came in that, in that time. Uh, first, he stopped in Hawaii, worked, uh, uh, by the way, just to give you some background, he worked on a small farm in the Philippines, taking care of Carabao. He was the Carabao boy. Uh, got to Hawaii, went to the pineapple fields, realized he was doing the same thing he was doing in the Philippines. And he heard uh, about the po potential of getting to the U.S. Got to the U.S. in, uh, in 1914, and he was enumerated in 1920 in, at the international apartments in the uh, international district. And so he, he is, is uh, he, he established himself uh, as, uh, as a, uh, a Filipino American at that time. And, and he had originally stopped in, first in California, heard about working in the salmon canneries in Alaska, came up to Seattle and that's where he settled up in, in the international district and was enumerated in that 1920 census. He gradually worked his way up the economic chain and uh, uh, a, 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 the richest uh, Chinese on the West Coast, Goon Dip Young, took my father under his wing and showed him uh, uh, the necessity for learning the labor contracting business because Chinese were gradually leaving the salmon cannery business and moving on to different other educational venues. My dad realized that there was a huge population of Filipinos that wanted to come to the United States, especially from his hometown in Santa Maria. He, he started uh, contacting the, his relatives and friends in the Santa Maria and he, in, uh, a, in the uh, Ilocos Sur, the province. And because of the extended families that, uh, that were very predominant in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the Philippines, a lot of our relatives and friends came and they, at one point in this whole process, my dad was responsible for supplying the summer labor uh, for a majority of the canneries in Alaska, working with the New England Fish Company and the Alaska Packers Association. He hired, he hired uh, uh, foremen that would be, uh, owe him allegiance. Um, and uh, he also, at the same time, uh, as he was rising to getting more affluent, he became the first president of the Filipino Community Commonwealth Club. And this picture of him is that the, they're celebrating the establishment of the Philippine Commonwealth. And he's sitting at the head table under the uh, picture of uh, Manuel Quezon. And there's a number of leading Filipinos here at this. Uh, Manang Dorothy could be probably more accurate in, in identifying those individuals. And I haven't taken a a, mic, um, not a magnifying glass to double check. I can see a couple Belen Braganza and, and uh, oh, a couple, oh God, there's another lady there. But at any rate, this is at the New Washington Hotel. And I mistakenly uh, said that, that uh, he had uh, started off as a dishwasher in this hotel. No, I was wrong. It was at, at a different hotel along with Salvador del Fierro, a future leader of the Filipino community. But when he first got to Seattle, he, was, he did uh, gardening jobs and he, uh, he worked as a waiter and he even did bowling alleys. Now, uh, once he started making money, he traveled between the Philippines and Seattle. And here's a picture of him with uh, General Artemio Riccardi who really instilled the notion of independence with my father. 
Artemio Cortardi was the only Filipino general to refuse to make the Pledge of Allegiance to the United States because he felt that they had they had reneged on their promise to uh, make the uh, if they were to get help military help from the generals to organize the Filipino military, they would uh, grant independence to the Philippines. They reneged on that, and he self-exiled in Japan. My father met him, and also my my mom, his future wife, uh, at the uh, restaurant uh, hotel. Uh, Louis Min or restaurant Louis Min, uh, what that was my mom's name, Louis Minda, at, in Japan on one of his trips. To, and a lot of Filipino sailors who Cynthia has, uh, has, has knows about, a lot of uh, Filipino sailors came and paid their respects to the general for his, uh, his independent stand and patriotic stand about wanting to have a free and independent Philippines. And, um, and my mom as well was deeply, deeply influenced. And there's my mom, the right, uh, this picture with me is a, God, I don't know how old, I was a little kid then. And my, my brother is next to him and first cousin, Manang uh, Auntie Dolly, uh, she was uh, single at the time. And uh, Auntie Nadi, Natividad Rudenstein, very interesting. Her husband was incarcerated as a, a, a Jewish uh, person in the prison in the Philippines. And another one of our, uh, my mom's cousins uh, claims that she saved his life by bringing him food uh, as much as possible while he was incarcerated. I keep in touch with Rosemary and uh, Rosemary is a younger one on the right-hand side of Auntie Nadi and, and uh, Auntie uh, and Molly is, is the oldest. This is the original house my father won in 1941, in April 1941. This is the 80th anniversary year of that uh, Washington State Supreme Court decision. That's the original house. And many of our relatives would stop and stay with us before they moved on after they found per more permanent housing. Now, it was not the first, he was not the first Filipino American to own this owned property in the state because of that. The first Filipino American to own the property was his sister. And, and my understanding after reading the lawyer, who the lawyer was that my father chose, I began to understand that, uh, the, that that lawyer, Austin Griffiths, uh, knew about sexism and racism and said, you know, that your sister needs to transfer that deed to you. So you will be the owner of the house. We have a better chance of winning the case. And she did so. And uh, I believe the year was 1935 that she transferred that to my dad for ex in exchange for some property that he bought in the Philippines. And uh, now uh, just getting very quickly to the uh, court decision, Washington State Supreme Court decision, what the Washington State Supreme Court decision was, uh, was based on a technicality that the Washington State Legislature had overlooked when they revamped the law and they tried to add wording to a law that prohibited uh, individuals who had not uh, professed allegiance to the United States uh, or aliens. They added wordage to that law. And that in itself was against the state law, which said that only one subject could be covered in a state law, and that had to be in the title. And the law was overturned on a technicality, uh, not so much for justice and equality, but on a technicality. So this is the interior of our house. It was a really nice house to grow up in. And uh, I can, as you can see, my, my brother who had a tragic boating at uh, Alaska has, was uh, very important in our lives. Uh, me having worked there for, paid for the first two years of school, 
but my brother also was in an accident uh, working a crab cannery for Wakefield Fisheries in uh, 1960. And uh, my auntie, Auntie uh, Dolly, stayed with us for a long period of time. And Auntie Dottie was a, an occasional visitor and they settled in California. Uh, empty Dolly, Auntie Dolly, it's not Empty Dolly, Auntie Dolly. Dolores so, Manalo. Do you have a current picture of the house? Has it been? Yeah, I do. I know you were and trying totally, to get. Uh, it's totally. It's you. You would revamped. Yeah. I yeah. Did, I could. I could sit it along. Yeah. I. It's I totally. Put it. It looks so different now. I. I was a stalker online and thought about putting it in here for <laughs> comparison purposes, but then I loved all of the historic photos, so then I. I didn't include. Yeah. It. But yeah. I think they took it to the ground and started over. That's how it looks anyway. Uh, well, I had to take care of the fireplace too. Jesus, I'll tell you, it was, it was a tough place to clean up. I can only imagine. Um, I, so we are one minute over officially. Um, and I don't want to rush you, Pio, because I know you have one more thing that you wanted to share. But I wanted to just let our audience know that. And then if the three of you are okay to stay on maybe a few minutes longer, I think there no, might be some questions. Uh, I, yeah, like I say, it. Uh, it was a great house to grow up and we weren't we weren't really well, the only people that the only person that really welcomed us to the near neighborhood was our next door uh neighbor mrs benson she was from norway and she welcomed us but we were basically not welcome in in, in the neighborhood we weren't we weren't welcome we lived in the projects up here in wedgwood from shearwater because of the U.S. Navy base. And when we moved across the street, um, not long thereafter, um, you know, we, we had BB guns, you know, shoot through our, our windows. I'm living in that house now and uh, eggs. And I recall that the reception was, you know, not very good. Yeah, you know? that when, when I would be working on the lawn, uh, individuals would come by and, and say, oh, you must be the gardener. Mm. Yeah. And I said, yeah, I am the gardener. <laughs> Auntie, was it, I mean, I'm, I know I'm going off track here, but um, did you have any, any resistance? Anybody resisting your, uh, your area of the Cordovas? I think we lost her. She's here, uh, she's on mute. Uh, I see. Were there um, were people uh, resistant to you living in in your area? Yes, yes. Um, in 1935, my dad bought a house in Madison Valley. We actually it was bought. Uh, I figured that it was bought in the name of the American-born children. My dad had two lawyers. He was a businessman, so he was able to go that way. When we moved there, the kids in the neighborhood couldn't play with us. Um, they couldn't, but uh, my family was large. And so we didn't need playmates. The, the kids would watch. It wasn't until after my dad uh, was killed in 1936. And then our house caught a fire a oh. few months later that the neighbor next door then sent her son, um, Tommy uh, Roselli came to play with my younger brother. After that, all the kids in the neighborhood to play with us and in fact, my house, even though at first we weren't welcome there in the valley, it was 27th and Denny, right below Madison. Mm. Uh, we were known as the Filipino house. There were <laughs> no other Filipinos in that valley. And uh, the, the black families didn't live down there. They were up on 25th, uh, 26th, oh, no, no, oh, the other way goes the other way, 23rd, 24th, 25th. And then down into the valley, it was basically white. And it was a... Um, blue collar uh, neighborhood. It wasn't fancy, but there were resistance, you know. Um, Can I listen? That's, um, that's the way it was. I mean, unfortunately, so uh, <laughs> during the 60s, when open housing came on, we were right on target. We fought for, <laughs> for open housing. I mean, we remembered all these things that happened when our parents were young and yep. we were children. Can so I, by can the I time yeah. Well, we were north of the redlining line. Can I read this, please? I, I, I wanted to set the tone for what, what Manang Dorothy is talking about and what the redlining. 
This article was written in 1931, and it was a current history. It was in a current history, uh, which is the academic side of, the, and it's called Filipino Immigration Viewed as a Peril. Mm -hmm. And it's written by C.M. Geth, who was a president, who was a president of the Immigration Study Commission. And this is the context for the early Filipinos that came here. And, and also, you know, with the early Filipinos here in Seattle, when, when they came with the, uh, the soldiers. This is written by C.M. Geth, June, volume 34, June 1931. I'm not going to read the whole, whole issue. It says, the report maintained that Filipinos are vain, unreliable, and of rather low mentality, since labor agents in the islands tend to select those of lower mentality as being more docile. <laughs> the fin Filipinos, like the Mexican peon, enters one kind of labor after another. An official California report shows them as rice harvesters, asparagus cutters, sugar beet laborers, melon pickers, tomo tomato pickers, celery planters, hop pickers, apricot pickers. <clears throat> now, they are very vain. When going to wash windows in private houses, they carry their window rags in a briefcase so as to appear as lawyers. Constantly, <laughs> constantly the Filipinos are displacing whites in hotels and restaurants and in the unskilled trades. Uh, the, these men are jungle folk and their primitive moral code accentuates the race problem even more than the economic difficulty. And last paragraph I'm gonna read you, the Filipino tends to interbreed with near moron white girls. The, result, <laughs> the resulting hybrid is almost invariably undesirable. The ever increasing brood of children of Filipino coolie fathers and low grade white mothers may in okay. time constitute a serious social burden. Now, and you know that that was the tenor of that time. That's right. One of the reasons, yeah, one of the reasons they were doing this is, I mean, there's several reasons. In 1924, the United States Congress stops the immigration from Asia completely, and it even uh, limits um, uh, immigration from Mediterranean countries where the people are darker than they are in Northern Europe. They couldn't get rid of the Filipinos. It took them ten years from thirty. 24 to 34, there had to be justification. In fact, when uh, uh, in all of the, um, the world's fairs that took place, they, they, what they did is they brought the people that they considered um, savages, the people from the North, <laughs> you know, they, they would highlight it, uh, head hunters, dog eaters, dog <laughs> and all that other stuff. These were the people who built rice terraces and, and you know, they had culture, yeah. was, but they were, they were not dressed in clothing up to here and I mean it was a different time as a kid I remember I mean one day I opened up the Seattle Times or the PR I forget which one and the headline was Filipino runs amok mm. um, I mean um, uh, I'm may sure interject I know Auntie I mean, wanted to you know and, and all it did in those days it diminished it made you cringe I was just a shy girl yeah you know so these are gathering places. These are times. Uh, the thing is that, you know, that's a very famous thing that you wrote. A lot of the, the Filipinos, the women were not morons. They just were women who fell in love with those Filipino men because they treated them like queens. And, and the thing is, and they produced beautiful children who did things really well afterwards. It, that was just sheer racism. And we're talking about what's happening now. We're talking the 20s. If those guys had briefcases, if people looked at the ships, uh, the manifest on the ships coming over, they have to say, why did they want to come to the United States? We would say, could we gather it? A lot of those men is students, 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 yep. students. They wanted to go to school. When I was doing my oral histories, not one person that we interviewed, uh, we'd say, why did you come here? Not one said, I wanted to go to Alaska and work 24 hours a day with no, you know, not nonstop a certain day. I wanted to work out in the fields, out in that hot sun. No. Well, they I'll say one thing. Alaska. 
They did work in the fields. They did these my, things and they had to eat. Yep. Some of these Pinoys, like my father, who came yeah. in 29, my father came in July of 1929. He wanted to get an education. Yeah. Well, what happened in October? The Great, Depression. the Great Depression. There was no, they couldn't go to school. My father finally got his high school degree at the age of 25 from Evanston, Illinois in 1935. So they were, and, you know, by then they couldn't go home. They were a because they didn't mm -hmm. make their millions. Mm -hmm. So well, you know, I, know, I, home, I just I but, just but want to share with you that, that you know, my you father know, that that law in 1934 when the status of Filipinos would change from uh, nationals to aliens. There was a rider on there. Yep. The Philippines becomes an independent country in 10 years, supposedly, but the war breaks out. There was a rider to that law. It was Filipinos, they want could go free of charge back to the Philippines, but they can never return. There were over 50,000 Filipinos in the United States right now because yeah. they could come. Right. Less than 3,000 took advantage of that free passage back to the Philippines. This is right in the middle of the Great Depression when people didn't have jobs. Right. They decided to stay here. Many times it's because they didn't fulfill what they were supposed to do, mm -hmm. you know? Or well, that's one of the things love my they started father, a family. You know, Manan Manan Dorothy, yes. my, my father established a scholarship for Filipino students at the University of Washington. You yeah. know that. He did that because he realized that many of the individuals who were coming here wanted exactly that. Right. And, and my he dad never did the same finished, thing. Yeah. He never finished high school himself. Auntie. Uncle, <laughs> Manon, uh, we've, we've segued off, you know, we're here to talk about historic yeah, places. Yeah, yeah. And no, so, so uh, Taylor, we, you can yeah, see yeah. that we've well, got a lot of passion about our history. No, no. Honestly, you all remind time. me of listening to oh, well, we my should grandmother talk about and Washington Hall where we had a good time. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. That was another we spot. Washington Hall on the docket? Um, that was another thing, yeah. We can, we can do a part two, the, the party okay, edition. What? Um, I don't know. Did we have Washington Hall? No, we no we didn't. No? We uh, we only had got, we only had an hour. That one got cut. But I'm okay. I'm up well, for one a thing about two. good times. We danced every weekend. I mean, dance, dance. Every, every weekend. Dance, dance. Was a, when I was growing up, it was at the Finnish Hall, Washington Hall, and if it was special, it was downtown in one of the Filipinos love to dance. I mean, you. And all we have pictures of all these dances. Sometimes you'd see the same men <laughs> as band in the bands, they would mix up these things. Growing my memories of Washington Hall are really interesting. We the Filipinos went there so often, they honestly thought the old timers thought that was our community center. In fact, the Filipino community used to have elections for their their officers at the Washington Hall. I remember Rudy Santos standing there giving a dollar to the people coming through uh, so they could vote. And, um, and he for, used to win every year. Just to guess back on track, we wanted to do Washington Hall. Uh, we were thinking of Rizal Park. We wanted to do yeah. the Filipino Community Center. Oh, yeah. So right. for those of you who are wondering why we chose those four, some of these places have very deep ties to us. And some of them are no longer there uh, or used, right? But, you know, we can come back for part two. <laughs> Whenever you yeah, but then we, Yeah, but the <laughs> thing is, I think, I think that really, even though we, there were a lot of things that were bad in our life, you know, outside of the gathering places, we we did have fun. I mean, there were times we oh, we could, yeah. you know, we we went beyond. We weren't going to let it get it down. Yep. It was yeah. We, and then on that, and, note, Dorothy, I do because um, we're fifteen minutes over. But I would love to end with you all talking about because yeah. you all are up to a lot of things. You're busy. You're booked and busy and doing a lot. Can you just tell us what you're up to on, is it Saturday? And I'll make sure that I include that in the follow-up email, but we'd love for you to just, in your own words, tell us, and then I will, I'll close this out. For the well, I'll say that um, my part in this anti-Asian hate panel happening, uh, sponsored by the Greater Seattle Filipino American National Historical Society, 
uh, seven people intergenerational are going to talk their response to this anti-Asian hate episode, this horrible thing that's been going on from our from our perspective. And I we have it's going we're making it ASL acceptable, uh, accessible, accessible, which I'm really, 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 really proud of. And Auntie's going to be speaking. I think the only reason I'm speaking that day is because so many of the young Asian Americans, the Filipino Americans think this is a new kind of thing that's happening. Yeah, yeah, no. really. I mean, Pilo P- P- and I are talking about things that happened. It never stopped. Read it this article. Did. Read I this mean, article. We could go on and on. Want- it's, it's, yeah. Anyway, it's this Saturday from 6 to 8 p.m. I will include that. And look up, uh, look it up on Greater Seattle Filipino American National Historical Society, GS Fonds, F-A-N-H-S. I will include a link. I I think Naomi found it. Did she find it, Naomi? Good. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 646. Thank you. This was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. So, so much. Sounds like we need to do a part two, and the focus of the part two can be all the party love. Oh boy! And we can really have some fun. Yeah. Um, you all are receiving a lot of love in the chat, and when I send you the three of you a follow up email, I'll be sure to share some of these comments because I think you should get your roses while you're here and really uh, read the impact that you're having on all of the folks who are with us tonight. So thank you. Well, again, a, a, a million salamats to Historic Seattle for letting yes. us talk. Yeah. Yes. Love the talking. Um, we'll chat soon. And it sounds like we're going to do a part two whenever it works. Whenever you all are really like not busy, because like I, I know you're doing a lot of stuff, but we'll chat. Okay. All right. Thank you everyone for coming. I will send a follow-up email. I'll gather actually all of the, all of the things that were mentioned and name drops. Oh, yes. It take me a little bit of time, but as soon yes. as I have the list, I will send the follow-up email and also include the recording link to this so that you can watch it again and again. <laughs> okay. I hope I don't I'm get ready. in trouble from uh, Terry Stafford and suspicion uh, for playing that on this. <laughs> you know, we're still on YouTube. I don't think they caught on to you. So you're okay. <laughs> they didn't cut our stream. Don't All worry. All right. Good. <laughs> All right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.